22nd. But I love it because God is a connecting God. He likes to connect things. He, he, he connects pieces that we don't expect. No matter how well we plan, no matter what we do to look to the future, and he always adds something in just to show that he's sovereign, to show that he's God. Amen? And something like that happened, and you guys are going to have a chance to be able to experience that today, uh, which I mean, I'm just so excited about. I mean, I just really am. I mean, when God laid something on my heart the other day, and, and I made a few phone calls to Randy, and it, it worked out, um, and it goes perfectly along with today's teaching. And if you remember correctly, the name of our series is now Take It Personally by Paul Chapel. So you should have, if you were here last week, have one of these books, these outline books, okay? If you don't, we have a few left. If you would like one, uh, just raise your hand and the ushers will come and bring you one if you do not have one and if you would like one. Um, if you do end up getting one, last week's um, fill in the blanks. You're going to have to find somebody to fill in those blanks. You know, when you, anytime you've got a book that's got blanks to be filled in, we like our blanks to get filled, right? But, or you can call me and I'll be more than happy to get you those uh, blanks to be filled. But this here is the actual book. Um, and then the yellow one's the outline. And again, it's Paul Chapel out of Lancaster, California. He uh, um, wrote this. It's a very simple read, very practical and really, it's just very simple on how to fulfill the Great Commission. And, and this is the series that we're going through right now. Um, so please remember uh, our pastor, Mark Brown. He's still in the Northeast with his family. Please keep him in, in your prayers. Uh, last week, the high school finished up their camp. Please continue to keep them in your prayers and all the works that God did through them. And as we speak right now, the junior high is finishing up their camp out on the fields behind you there. And I know God has done some amazing things. I know he has. Uh, I've talked with um, uh, Josh a little bit, and he shared with me there's been some professions made. Praise the Lord. And, um, and then also, please keep in prayer, the Honduras team is back. And I have no doubt that there were many professions of faith made, and uh, you guys are going to get to experience that a little bit today. Praise the Lord. Um, and you'll see here in a little bit. Now, when we started last week, we started with an illustration that was out of the book when it came to making a difference. And going back through and just talking about it, just to, to, to do a little refresher, the, the title of last week was called Making a Difference. And we talked about the value of one person, uh, the importance of reaching one person. And we talked about the eternality of a soul and that heaven and hell are real. And we looked at scripture to be able to back this up. We also spoke about how Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life, right? He's the only way to heaven. And for most of us, I think we all understand that. We, we know John 14, 6. We also spoke about how Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that was his responsibility. That's what he did. He came to seek lost man, but he also came to seek... His lost image. Man lost God's image at the fall back in Genesis chapter 3. And God set up this plan and through his divine providence, through his prophecy, from uh, the ages and eons of time, he knew this was going to be happening. So he set in plan uh, for Jesus Christ to come and to die on the cross. And he knew that he was going to have to seek and to save. And after Adam and Eve lost God's image... Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, now he's able to replace his lost image and place it back into its rightful spot into our lives for those who place their faith and trust in Jesus. We talked about, though, it's our responsibility. Even though it was Jesus' responsibility to seek and to save, it's our job now with this message to go win, baptize, and teach. That's what we are to do as a church. We should do it with joy and happiness and gladness that that Lord would even allow us to do something that precious. But in doing so, we have to take ownership. Ownership of this mission, of this ministry. And we talked a little bit about preparing a message, and we'll talk a little bit more about this week uh, and um, today. Now, today's title would be Presenting the Gospel. And that's really what we're going to be going over is just really a basic outline of presenting the gospel and what people need to know and what we need to know. 
And some of you might be thinking, you know, I know these things. I've heard these things before. Yes, we have, and we do know, and we've heard the gospel presented. We've heard many messages on this. But like I think I said last week, we need to hear it again. And we need to hear it again and again and again because we often forget when we leave this building, we're entering into our mission field. And so each lesson starts with an illustration. So I like the illustration in this one for this week. And so I've kind of consolidated and condensed it down a little bit. But the illustration that the book gives is there's a, there's a um, barber. He's got a barber shop and, uh, and somebody has led him to Christ, right? And he's excited about what God has done and he just wants to share the message with somebody else. So he makes a commitment. And he says, the next person that comes in and sits down in my chair, I'm going to share the gospel with. So a barber, you know, a barber doesn't just cut hair, he also shaves. And he's old school, so he likes to use that straight razor blade, right? So he puts the tarp around the guy's neck and has him in a chair. And he's trying to think, okay, he's a little nervous. And he, he puts his hand on the guy's head and he pulls it back and he's getting ready to shave. And he says, you ready to meet God? <laughs> you know? So, so obviously... That's a joke, and it's just a good illustration that's teaching us about presentation, right? There is tact. There is a time. There is a time to present properly. And as much as this man really wanted to share the gospel, um, that probably wasn't the greatest thing to say in that moment, right? But his intentions were proper, so praise the Lord for that. Um, but that's what we're talking about is that everybody is different, but the gospel is simple. And we have a responsibility to present the gospel in a way that's going to be effective in the lives of those that are around us. And again, each way might be a little bit different, but the message is the same. So what is it when we give the gospel and we share and present, what is it on our minds that we ought to be looking towards? And it's something very as simple as can be found in Revelation 21.5. Um, some of these verses aren't in the book. They're ones that God led me to share. I believe this is one of them. Revelation 21.5 says, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Isn't that beautiful? He makes all things new. That's true. And that's faithful in what he wants to do in the lives of everyone. Don't you remember the moment you received Jesus as your Savior? I remember it for me. I was literally in that moment made new. Now, some of you may have said, well, I didn't have that experience, and that's okay. But you're still here. You understand that through walking with the Lord, he has made you new. This should be our desire for every man and woman that, honestly, we come in contact with. Now, obviously, we understand uh, there's a time to present, right, barbershop, and there's a time not to. And God, if we're sensitive, God's going to give us those mind, that mindset of when to. So today's really teaching is more on equipping and preparing you, saints. And if you're, not he if, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you know what you're going to get? You're going to get the gospel because that's what we're going to lay out. We're going to lay out once again exactly the proper steps and what the Bible says about knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. So when it comes down to it, remember, we're, we're equipping and we're preparing you to go out into this world and share. And so it takes sharing the gospel, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It takes, God has given us a message, and this message is important for the world to know. It takes understanding the gospel. And if you're using, following along, this is on page seven of your handbook, okay? And so this message that God has given us is a matter of life and death. I mean, it's, it's that serious of a message. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, it's a matter of life and death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere, but it's either going to be with the Lord or it's going to be separated. Death means separation, like we talked about last week. It's a message that deserves 100% effort on our part. And I hope that that challenges you because how much effort have we individually been doing and taking? How much effort have we been putting into the gospel message itself, I hope that there's some conviction there because I know there is for me. There is some conviction for me, as there should be. And every one of us, First Bible members here, every one of the universal church, which is everybody who's been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, you as a church, everyone should be a minister of this truth to, make, to see all people be made new. 
That is our responsibility. So if you have your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. We understand this and know this as the gospel. The gospel simply means good news. And the good news broken down biblically is found right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So I'm going to read verses 1 through 4, and then we'll just take a look at it, at it quickly. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died and was for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and, on, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Father God, we love you. And once again, we thank you for this opportunity for us to assemble um, as your family, as your, as your bride, as the church. Lord, you've, you've, ta you've tasked us, Lord God, with something so very precious and important. And I'm so thankful that you have laid upon our pastor's heart and our leader's heart to move forward, to really engage and encourage and motivate the church body to go and share the gospel. Personally, Lord God, as we meet people on the streets in our families and friends and across the road, but also internationally, Lord God, as we have a team that you know we just brought back from Honduras and thank you for bringing them home safely. So Lord, I ask and pray that right now you would work within our hearts, lay people upon our hearts, um, opportunities, and uh, just teach us, Lord God, so that we might be able to just be that much closer to you, have more of your heart, and have a desire to share this wonderful truth of salvation. We love you and praise you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, the gospel here, as we've seen before, it's, it's something that is received, but it's also something that we stand in, okay? Oftentimes, uh, we look at the gospel as a message, we receive it, and then we move on. But we've heard many times from this pulpit, uh, in many ways, that the gospel itself, it's the good news you can be saved, but it's also the good news that you can be sanctified, that you can grow in him. And the overall goal that God has for all of us is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.20 says this, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You can't stand unless you have a foundation. And there's got to be a, a, a piece to that foundation that keeps it strong and keeps it where you're not going to fall. It's not going to adjust. It's going to be stable. And that piece is Jesus Christ. And he's given us his apostles. He's given us his prophets. And he's given us that ability to, to grow and build upon this foundation. And he's given us First Bible Baptist Church in order to continue that. That is our responsibility. That's what he's given to us. It's a gift, right? But it's a message that we receive. It's a message that we stand on. But also it says right here, in the last part of verse 2, unless ye believe in vain. It's also a message that can cause some problems too in a person's life if they don't receive it right. You can believe for the wrong reasons. If you have a head knowledge rather than a heart knowledge. That happened to me when I was young. I said the prayer. And I thought I was fine, but there was... No difference in my life. I went right back to my old life. And see, it doesn't work like that. I thought that I was saved. When Paul Wolf asked me, are you saved? I thought, oh yeah, I said that prayer. See, I thought I was saved, but I actually wasn't. Because I received that message in vain. It was emptiness. I did not, when it comes down to it, I did not believe the message. I knew there was a God. I knew there was Jesus. But I did not believe that he was going to, he saved my soul. See, the end result of this message is salvation in Christ's likeness. We can believe for wrong reasons, and it happens so many times. You know, when it comes down to it, and you look at these two pieces, uh, the book of Acts gives us two questions that you ask that is connected to salvation and sanctification. And in Acts chapter 16, verse 30, the Philippian jailer says, What must I do to be saved? What, what do I need to do? See, it became personal. This wasn't the nation of Israel. This is individuals. What must I do to be saved, right? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's the salvation. But when you look over in Acts chapter 9, verse 6, 
Paul the Apostle says, what wilt thou have me to do? See, those are the two questions that we as a church should, should be asking. For salvation for a person is, how can I get saved? Well, let me show you. Then after that, okay, now what do you want me to do? Well, let me tell you. Well, right now we are sharing with you today what God wants you and I to do. It's our responsibility. See, this is an old message that brings about new results. Amen? It's an old message. It's been given for over 2,000 years. And it's been handed down from person to person. It's a message of consistency. It's a message of truth. It's a message of newness. But oftentimes, mankind likes to pervert this message, likes to change it. That's what religion does. It takes something so simple and it changes it. But at the same time, this message is useless if we keep it to ourselves. It will absolutely do nothing to make a difference in the life of anyone if we keep it to ourselves. So when it comes to sharing this message, we've got to avoid some extremes. We have to avoid some extremes. We aren't to make it complicated. You know, it's easy to make the gospel complicated. If you know scripture, if you know the word of God, you know all the big lingo, all the theological words, sanctification, justification, redemption, all important biblical words. But to a new per, a believer, someone that you're sharing the gospel may not know what these words are. So we don't want to complicate it where it's over their heads. We don't want to emotionalize it. There are religions out there that it really have built off of emotion and make people think that if, oh, you don't have, you're not showing any emotion and you don't, that's the spirit of God's not in you. See, that's how the spirit of God works. He's going to bring that out of motion. Well, you know, I used to be an emotional person, but I'm not now. The Lord has brought me through that. I actually fight everything I can to not to shed a tear. That's just what I've turned into. I don't know why. But I used to cry the drop of a hat. I just, just bawl like a baby, you know. Um, but now I don't cry as much. I stop myself. But, and, and that's okay. But what I'm saying is, is that if we turn this into an emotional experience, we're complicating the message of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, we don't want to make it shallow. There's something out there called easy believism, Right? Just, just say a prayer and you can spend eternity with the Lord. That ha this happened many times uh, in, in, in years past where you, people would knock on the door, hey, you want to know what it's, you want to spend eternity with God? Absolutely. Just say this prayer, you'll spend eternity with God. Easy believism. Oh, just, yeah, that's all you got to say and then you can live your life the way you want. And see, that's not the way God works. It's not a sales pitch. Because if you, again, can talk somebody into salvation, somebody else can come talk them out of it. They can do this. They've got to want it more than you want it. Acts 20, verse 21, tells us how simple it is. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith to our Lord Jesus Christ. It's very simple. See, when a person trusts in Jesus as their Savior, there's going to be a natural repentance. Natural. I remember there was a lot of things in my life, and after I got saved, nobody had to come over to my house and tell me I needed to remove them. It was the Spirit of God that started speaking to me. You need to get this pe these people out of your life. You need to get this out of your life. You need to stop looking at this. See, that was, that was uh, the conviction of the, Spirit, uh, of the Spirit of God. That was evidence of God working in my life. See, I had to see my sin as exceedingly sinful. See, we have to get people lost before we get them saved. They have to see that they've violated God, that they've violated His law, they've sinned against the Holy God. And if we make it so simple that they don't understand that, then the chances of them actually having a true conversion to Christ may not occur. Plus, also, they might live a long time like I did, really believing I was saved when I wasn't. So we have to make sure to avoid the extremes and have a plan. We have to build a plan in our lives and how we're going to share the gospel. You know, I love the book of Acts, and um, I love Paul's life. If you get a chance, read through the book of Acts and just see how he witnessed to people and how he shared the gospel with people. His first recorded sermon is in Acts 13, uh, verse 6 through 41, and we're not going to go there, but he breaks it down in three simple pieces. He spoke about Israel's history. He was given them account of their choice of failure. He spoke about the facts of the gospel. He gave them account of how the gospel can become their success, okay? 
And then he spoke about human need, an account of eternal freedom, that forgiveness and justification. Yes, those are biblical words. And this is what men are needing and women are needing. We need forgiveness in our lives. And so when we're sharing the gospel, that's an essence of what you're doing. You're helping them to see that in their past they have failed. They failed a true living God. You're helping them to see that they can have success through the simple message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you're helping them to see a need and give them an account of that eternal freedom from sin and how they will spend eternity with the Lord. And, and as I was thinking of this, I was thinking of it almost like someone who has a warrant out for their arrest. When someone has violated a law, the city or the state, federal, whatever it might be, misdemeanor, felony, they violated a law and they missed their court date or whatever it might be, they are now um, have a warrant out for their arrest. And if that person knows this, for some time they're looking over their shoulder, they're driving the speed limit, making sure everything's okay, right? They, they're not going to take a chance at all to make a mistake, to give a police officer a reason to get them or to arrest them. But what happens after time with this person with a warrant is apathy. They start thinking, oh, I've gotten away with this. They might forget about the warrant. They start getting a little bit more courageous and a little bit more adventurous, and, and they forget about it. And then one day they get pulled over or something happens, and they find themselves in jail and back before the judge. Now put that in, in the sense of a lost person. A lost person has violated the law of God. They've, they have offended a holy God. And whether they know it or not, they do. And what I mean by that is that the Bible says that there's a light put in all of us and God has revealed himself to us according to conscience and creation. And then there are those who have actually heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if they've rejected all of that, it's almost like now there's a warrant out for their arrest. And, and you know what? It's all in God's timing. All illustrations break down. I understand that, right? But now you have a person who knows they, they maybe had some conviction in their life that they violated against the holy God, but they said no and they've gone about their life. They might be looking over their shoulder a little bit, but over time they've forgotten about it. Their conscience is now seared and they've forgotten completely that they have violated this law. And then there comes that day that they take their last breath. And they take their last breath and they find themselves before a holy God. And now they have to pay. Now they have to answer for their crimes. You see, a person, all people are like this that don't know Jesus. They need forgiveness and they need justification. They need someone to come into that courtroom and to say, hey, I need to be forgiven of this and I need all of, all of my crimes to be exonerated. That's what a person's, they're, they're just throwing themselves at the mercy of the court. And that's the very thing that God did for people. That's what, and that's what we're fighting. That's what doesn't make sense at times to us as a church. Because that's exactly what happened. There is justification that they are forgiven for all of their sins. And it can all be wiped away just by believing in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. So I say all that, that the next portion that we're going into is presentation. But we have something special here. And, and this is what I'm talking about when... When I, you know, I didn't plan this weeks ago. This is just something that God did. Because you get right now the opportunity to actually see the presentation take place. Watch this. Do you believe in the Bible? Yeah, a lot. Would you like me to show you what the Bible teaches? Because at the end of the day, what I say isn't important. Um, no sé si le gustaría saber lo que la Biblia dice o enseña acerca de esto, porque al final, eso es lo importante. Okay, um, let, me, let me show you some uh, verses. Te voy a mostrar un par de versículos. Dele, no hay problema. Okay. This is a, this is a very important two verses. Estos dos versículos son muy importantes. Si los pudiera leer, los que están marcados. Ocho y nueve. Porque por gracia de Dios soy salvo. Porque por gracia soy, soy salvo. Por mi Dios, por la fe. Por eso, no, por eso de vosotros, por eso es el don de Dios. Esto está en inglés, va, está en español. Sí, en inglés, sí, okay. Okay. Le, le No por obras, para que nadie se gloríe. Se gloríe. Sí. Sí. So, that means that even someone like me, 
Eh, eso quiere decir que alguien, incluso alguien como él, que ha hecho muchas cosas malas, can go to puede ir al cielo. At the end of the day, Porque al final del día, it's grace, it's a gift. es gracia, es un regalo. It's, it's unmerited favor. God's saying, es un favor inmerecido. I want to call you my child. Even though you've done nothing to earn that. Dios diciéndonos, yo te quiero, quiero que usted sea mi hijo, aunque no haya hecho nada para okay. merecerlo. All you have to do, it's like, uh, does anyone have a job? I, I do have. Uh, we want to give you this. Si yo le quiero regalar esto, por ejemplo. No hay But what do you have to do if I'm going to give you this? ¿Qué tiene que hacer si yo se lo doy? Solo tomarlo. Take it, take it. Hey, gracias. Exacto. Dale, tomarlo. Gracias. Tomarlo. 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 Sí. 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 Yeah. So. It's just like that. God offers his gift of grace. Así exactamente funciona. Nos da el regalo de su gracia. We just have to accept it. Y, y solo tenemos que aceptar el regalo de Dios. Uh, if you want to read it in your uh, in si no, Juan. En Juan, está Juan, Juan 3:16. Juan 3. Juan 3, 16. Juan 3. Yes. Juan 3, 16, ahí está subrayado. Porque de tal manera amó Dios al mundo que ha dado su hijo unigénito para que todo aquel que en él cree no pierda más mas tenga vida eterna, porque no envió Dios a su Hijo al mundo para condenar al mundo, sino para que el mundo sea salvo por él. Sí. Do you, do you have any kids? ¿Usted tiene hijos? Sí. Would no. you, you don't know me. Pero usted no lo conoce. Would you send your kids to die in my place? ¿Usted enviaría a su hijo a morir por mí? She, she has kids. She tells people all the time. She has a no. son. Ella, ella le dice todo el tiempo porque ella tiene hijos. You wouldn't do it. Exactly. Because you don't know me. But God, yeah. God didn't want a single person to go to hell. Pero Dios lo hizo porque no quería que nadie fuera al infierno. So he sent his only son. Y él, Dios envió a su único hijo. Jesus to come Jesus. down to this earth. Ya estaba escrito. Okay. It was already written down that you would come. Yes. And sí. Era yes. una profecía que ya estaba escrito que, que Dios iba a enviar a su hijo. It was a prophecy. That's, it y, was, y el mundo lo sabía, pues. It was iba a matar a... 600 years before. Había, era una profecía 600 años antes de que... Sí. Yeah, that's... You know, um, we're, we're from another country. Somos de otro país. And yeah. we came here to preach the word of God. Y hemos tenido que venir hasta acá para poder predicar el Evangelio. Because we know people... Porque sabemos... Not only do people... Que la gente... Near our city. No solo la gente cerca de nuestra ciudad. Ya en Kansas. Uh, need, need the word of God. No solo ellos necesitan la palabra de Dios. But people around the world need the word of God. Pero la gente alrededor de todo el mundo necesita. Necesita the word of God. But um, there's once many people in San Pedro Sula to hear the word of God. Quisiéramos hacer que toda la gente de San Pedro Sula escuchar la palabra del Señor. But at the end of the day. Pero al final del día. We have to make a choice. Tenemos que hacer una elección. Are we going to accept God's gift uh, of eternal si life? Si vamos a aceptar el regalo de Dios de la vida eterna. Um, here's another verse. It el, says que este verso dice Juan 3:3. Juan 3:3. Uh, aquí está. Respondió Jesús y les dijo: De cierto, de cierto os digo que el que no naciere para el nuevo no puede ver el reino de Dios. Yeah. Um, we have to be born again. Tenemos que nacer de nuevo. To be a follower of Christ. Para ser hijos de Dios. Um, so, by born again, that means uh, y nacer de nuevo significa believe in Christ. Creer en Jesús. Like many people do. Como mucha gente lo hace. But you have to Pero ask for forgiveness of your sins. Tiene que pedirle perdón de sus pecados. And you have to believe. You have to believe in your heart. Y creer en su corazón. And you have to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Y confesarlo como su Señor y Salvador. Would you, would you be interested in praying this evening? No sé si usted estaría interesado en, en orar y aceptar a Jesús en su corazón esta tarde. Oremos. Es interesante la oración. Es interesante. Yeah. Importante. Okay. Um, here's what you're going to do. Vamos a hacer esto. You're going to repeat after me. Uh, va a repetir después de mí. So, okay. Okay, so. All right. Jesus. Uh, Jesús. Uh, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Gracias por morir en la cruz por mis pecados. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Yo reconozco que soy pecador. Jesus, I know you rose again from the grave. Yo sé que tú te levantaste de los muertos. And you conquered sin and death. Y venciste a la muerte y al pecado. Jesus, I want the Holy Spirit to live inside of me. Jesus, yo quiero que tu Espíritu Santo venga a mi corazón. Jesus, I'm asking you to come live in my heart. Jesus, te pido que vengas a vivir en mí. And forgive me of my sins. Y perdonarme de mis pecados. 
Jesus, please be my Lord and Savior. Señor, sé mi Señor y Salvador. Jesus, I love you. Jesús, te amo. And I thank you for coming down to earth for me and to die in my place. Y te doy gracias por venir a la tierra y morir en mi lugar. These things I ask in your name. Te pedimos todo esto en tu nombre. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Amen. Isn't that exciting? I mean, does that just not make your blood boil? It really does. Uh, there's nothing like being able to lead someone to Christ. And I don't know if you saw in there, I just love to see whenever uh, the gentleman said, yeah, that's prophecy. You know, Jesus came down and Sean got all excited. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. That was, you know, and, uh, but that was good. And so you guys got the opportunity. Now, that video is actually about 25 minutes long. And so we had to condense it down, obviously. And, but there was really great dialogue in between this gentleman and, and Sean and this interpreter. And uh, please be praying for him. I think if, I'm not exactly sure how many professions of faith were made. I know it was significant. And now, uh, from the very first night after the salvations were made, immediately the pastor, Pastor Jose, and them started going back in to, uh, to, to do follow-ups and make another touch and to encourage. And, um, and that's what it takes. Uh, and so please pray for Jose and that team down there because now they have the work ahead of them to be able to go and, and, and to reach them and encourage them and invite them to a place where they can grow. And so when we look at, you saw a clear presentation of what the gospel looks like, right? There are some things that we want people to know that they have to realize in order to receive Christ as their Savior. And, um, you know, one thing is God's love. That's very important. I, I know that um, I've heard stories and I've been part of uh, a long time ago when I was a kid where it was all death, hell, fire, and damnation, right? Right? And, and I'll be honest, there's probably a time for that. But I think overall, people need to know that they're loved. They need to know that there is someone out there that loves them. And it may not be a person. It may be something they're going through, and they're not being shown very much love in whatever situation there is. But they need to know that God loves them. And this is a verse that we know, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And uh, I like how uh, when they started laughing a little bit because Sean was like, hey, you don't know me. Would you give your kids for me? And they started chuckling and laughing and, because nobody would. Nobody here in their right mind would give their kids for uh, uh, someone who's con uh, committed some felonies, murder, extortion, rape, whatever it might be. None of us here in our right minds would do so. And I, and I don't say that to take away from what God did. It's just we would not do that. But that's exactly what God did. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to go into that courtroom and say that you're not guilty, you're justified, I forgive you. See, people just need forgiveness. They need to know that they're loved. And then they need to know and realize their condition. A lot of people don't realize that they've offended a, uh, a, a true living holy God. And, and like I said earlier, um, You've got to get, people have got to know that they're lost before you can get them saved. They've got to know that they have violated and done some things wrong. And Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That's pretty self-explanatory. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, I use this illustration, and it's probably because I worked with children for so long, all right? And, uh, but it's a simple one. I don't just use it with children, I use it with adults too, but... Um, I'm using it with you guys, right? So, but, so I use this illustration that um, I would bring somebody up with me and stand right next to me. And I'd say, okay, if God was over by that wall and he gave us one jump to get to him, just one jump, you had to jump to God, that's what he expects, so that's what we should do, right? And so I would have this kid or whoever, and we would jump like this and sometimes I would jump on purpose further than them and sometimes not. And I would say, hey, look, you made it further than me. Good job, you know, and somebody else might come. Wow, they made it even further and we make a big deal about it. But then I'd say, oh, wait a second. God's right there. We've fallen short of God's expectation. We fell short of what God wanted us to do. You may have gotten a little bit further than I did and I may have gotten a little bit further than somebody else, 
but we've all fallen short of the glory of God because we've all sinned against a holy, righteous God. So a person needs to understand this. They need to understand their condition. They need to understand where they, when they stand before the Lord, that they have failed. And then you look at the notice of God's price. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you have to understand that because of your sin, you have earned death. That's what a wage is. You go work, you get paid money. If you um, sin, you get paid in death. That's the penalty, okay? And we have to understand, and you have to understand, I had to understand that because of that death, it has kept me separated from a true living God, okay? So notice the price for sin. And at this point, the person must believe that Christ died for you. They have to know that Christ, Jesus Christ died for that person. Romans 5, 8 says, But God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That word committed means shown. He showed his lo uh, love toward us that while we were sinners, while we were in a state of death, while we were in a state of disobedience, he died for you and me. We didn't have to make our lives better in order for him to like us. We didn't have to clean up our act. We didn't have to get out of whatever heinous sin that we were in. We don't have to do that, then go to God, okay? Yes, we will eventually be asked to leave that sin, but you can't clean up your life. You don't have the ability. I don't have the ability. We don't have the ability, but God does, you see, God does. And when a person's sick, they go to the doctor in order to get fixed. They don't get better first before they go. So we have a sickness called sin, and that sin is keeping us separated from God, which is worse than anything that we could ever imagine this side of eternity. So what do we do? We go to the great physician. We ask him to forgive us, to heal us, and to cleanse us from our sin. And then that's when we are made whole. This is what a person must understand, that Jesus Christ died for them specifically. And then five, confess their faith in Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess thy mouth with the Lord, the Lord Jesus and believe in all thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That means you, anybody. He will never reject any person that comes to him, not one. And he didn't make it a work that we have to do. If he said uh, for the world, now this sounds silly, I understand, but if he said for the world to be saved, you have to come to First Bible, go on the south side, climb up the wall, climb over the building and jump off over on the other side, then you can be saved. I know that sounds silly, but if that was the way, then you know what? The entire world would be here. They would all be on that side trying to do so. But you know what? Not everybody has the ability to do something like that. They can't walk. Maybe they can't. They don't have the strength. They don't have arms, whatever it might be. So see, God didn't make it where it was impossible. He made it a possibility there as saying a simple prayer. If you just bow your head and you confess with your mouth and believe with all your heart, you can know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It's that simple. See, God wanted to make it that simple for you and me. Once you get to this point, it's time to lead someone into a decision. Our decision should not just be to share the gospel, but we should want to see that gospel given for fruit to come and then for that fruit to remain. But the key is listening to the Holy Spirit of God. God desires for that person's salvation more than we do, more than they do, actually. It's, not God's, it's, it's God's will that, that none should perish, but all come to repentance. So our hearts should follow the same suit. John 15, 16 says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it. And so this is a beautiful verse because there's promises here. I promise you that if you walk out of this building and you go out into your mission field and you have this heart, you understand that God has chosen you specifically you understand that he's ordained you to fulfill this great commission. I promise you that if you have sincere heart, if you ask God to bring someone into your life, he will bring somebody for you to share the gospel with. 
But oftentimes we're not sensitive to that. We allow the world's pressures and the craziness of this life to, to blind us and to obscure our eyes and our thoughts to be looking for that person. So we have to make sure that when you guys got to see an awesome opportunity or an awesome example, I should say, of someone leading someone to Christ. That is beautiful. At that moment, the angel's rejoicing because that man received Jesus as their Savior. So we're not going to go over and look at page 13. But on page 13 in your outline, there are follow-up questions for the point of decision. I encourage you to read through them. What they are is uh, when someone comes to that place of decision, it's almost like going back through the gospel quickly again, just to make sure that they understand everything that you've just explained. And then at the same time, preparing to share the gospel, page 14, we're not going to spend time there. You guys can go and look at, this is, these are verses that they're encouraging you. I encourage you, we encourage you to memorize so that you will be prepared to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The presentation is where you want to see people to come to, to those points of understanding, but we ourselves need to be prepared. Now, in doing this, when you get out and you put yourself in a situation, you're going to deal with all types of questions, all types of thoughts, all types of objections. And, and he gives a list in the book here of just a, a handful that we're going to go through and look at. And I'm sure there's many more. If, if you go out sharing the gospel, you're going to come up with a lot of, of, of objections to why a person may not receive Christ. Um, but here we're going to go through these seven and, and pretty quickly just to look at them. One is, I have always been a Christian. There are people that believe that they've always been saved. A lot of times this happens uh, to someone who might have been born in a Christian household and been brought up in a religious system or uh, uh, whatever that might be, whether it's uh, second generation, third generation, this can happen. But the scripture that we go to is John 1, 12. It says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So it, it clearly says right here, as many as received him. It's a choice. Just like Paul talked about over in 1 Corinthians 15, a message that must be received. So the only way that you can become a son of God is by receiving and embracing this message. Remember that gift, like Sean talked about that there's a gift, and if you don't take it and make it your own, then it's not ever going to be yours. There's a gift still sitting in that, under that Christmas tree from a year ago, and it has your name on it. Well, it was never became yours because you didn't receive it. You didn't open it. You didn't make it your own. So in order for a person to become Christian, they have to receive this message. Two, I've asked God to forgive me many times. Um, I don't have the exact verse on top of my head, but there's a verse in Hebrews that talks about how Jesus Christ died once. He died once on the cross. He didn't die twice. He's not going to come back and do it again. He only did it one time. And so because he died once, we only need to ask him one time to come into our lives. The moment you do that, the Spirit of God comes inside of you and seals you and allows you to become a child of God. Now, a lot of the times people might have this mindset. They might truly be saved, the problem is they've never put themselves in a position where they can grow. And, and a lot of this is taken care of just through the simple process of discipleship. So if you lost your salvation, Jesus Christ would have to come back down here and die on the cross for you. And that's not going to happen again. It's not going to happen. One time Jesus Christ did that. The third one here, this is, this is simple. I need to do something to earn it. Well, we just kind of discussed about jumping over the building and all of that. But here in... Uh, Galatians 2.21 is a scripture that shows us that if Jesus Christ, if the law can save man, then Jesus Christ died in vain. It says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. I think we understand this. I mean, there, if there's something that you and I could do good enough, and we've already seen the verses that talks about our righteousnesses, our righteousness is not good. And if you look at this next verse here, Isaiah 64, 6, um, which goes along with this same, I, the next one that says, I'm good enough, I'm not a very bad sinner. Those two kind of go hand in hand because Isaiah 64, 6 says, but we are all as unclean thing and all of our righteousness as are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. 
It's so simple, I need to do something, or I'm good enough. These kind of go hand in hand because it's all built around righteousness, self-righteousness. There's nothing that you and I could ever do to please God outside of the work of Jesus Christ. That's why we need him. That's why we have to have him in our lives because he came to fulfill the law and he filled it perfectly. He, he filled it completely. There's nothing more that needs to be done. That's why he said on the cross, it is finished. The work is done. There's nothing more. But we keep trying to add to that. We keep trying to have to add something to this salvation. Why? When the work is done, why are we trying to make it more difficult than it really is? I'm good enough. No, we're not good enough. Our, 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 our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's interesting because, and I know you've heard this, it's true, though. We, we so compare ourselves with, with people that are worse than us, you know. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Well, at least I'm not like that. I've never heard somebody say, well, I'm not good like Jesus, or try to compare themselves to Jesus because they would fail. It would be a failure. So you're never going to compare yourself with somebody who has a better testimony or has lived a better life than you. It's always somebody else who is worse off, right? We fell our own standards on our own. How can a person fulfill God's if we fell our own, right? We set up our own laws, our own standards in our life. We end up breaking our own conscience by failing those. Number five here, doesn't death end everything? How do we know there is a real heaven and hell? Well, if we start with Scripture as being the final authority, we saw last week in Luke 16 what the Bible says about hell. We know it's not a parable. We know that it's truth, right? Hebrews 9, 27 says, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, it's the judgment. See, this type of thought process is a convenient man-made religion. It's convenient when someone says, Well, I just don't believe anything happens after this. Really? Well, that's really convenient for you. It really is. It's convenient for mankind to think that way. Because then that tells us that there's no justice and there's no judgment. There's no justice for the evil and wickedness that's on this earth. You see what I'm saying? I mean, really, with that thought process, there is no bad, there is no good. You might as well just do what you want to do and enjoy it because there's not going to be any consequences. Just go out and do what you want to do. It becomes convenience. And we have in Galatians chapter 5 that really talks to us about all those sins and fruits of the flesh. We might as well just go fulfill as many as we want because there's not going to be any accountability. Well, obviously, that's not true. And so without there being eternal judgment or um, a forgiveness of that uh, eternal penalty, uh, without that, it's just, it just becomes a person's uh, way of living their own, their own life. They just want to go out and do what they want to do, and they make it convenient for themselves. And then here, number six, I don't want to give up my lifestyle and my friends. That's kind of where I was at when I got saved, or right before I got saved. I don't want to give up my lifestyle. I enjoyed my alcohol. I enjoyed my drugs. I enjoyed all of that. That sin sure was pleasurable for a season. And, and I, I even remember, and I, I may have shared this last week when I said, you know, I really need to go back to church, but I need to find a place I can go that will let me drink. You know, That's, that was my mindset. And so I didn't want to give that up. But as soon as I met the true living God, Jesus Christ, it was not a problem. I wanted to give it up. Mark 8, 36 says this, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? We talked about this last week. And see, what I realized is that my lifestyle was not worth spending eternity separated from God. I love my friends. I still talk to them every now and then. I pray for them because I want them to see, know Jesus as their Savior. But at the same time, I could not follow them where they were going because it's not where God was wanting me to go. That was not my destination. Number seven, I think as long as I'm sincere in what I believe, that's all that matters. We can all be sincere about different issues in life according to truth, but we can also, with that, we're all sincerely wrong if it's not according to God's word. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, um, there, are, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There's a lot of people who are living by um, religions and they've created them or they've followed other people, and they really think that they're going to end up in a place, a paradise, or whatever it might be. But the Bible says in the, end of the, in the ways at the end thereof are the ways of death. And so sincerity is good, but it's not the answer. 
Now, when we move down to, we're going to jump something really quick because we don't have time to spend there. But on point three, making a soul winning visits on page 24, um, we're just, we're not going to go over this. It's just, I'm giving this to you so you guys can fill in your blanks. We're going to talk more about this on August 22nd because there is going to be some similarity to this, okay? But this is talking about knocking on doors. You know, when you go out, you want to introduce yourself. Remember, you're not an invited guest. So you've got to introduce yourself. Tell them what church you're with. Explain why you're there. Invite them to church. Determine if this is the time or the right time to continue the visit. Okay? Um, that's an important. Be sensitive to the Spirit of God. And I like this one here. Look for an opportunity to turn the conversation back to Jesus Christ. And then exchange contact information. And like I said... Uh, Salt and Light Ministry is going to be somewhat similar to this, but it is going to be a little bit different. And then practical tips you see there on page 28. You guys can go there, read yourself, read down through there. It's just giving you tips what to do if, when you do go out and you share the gospel. But where I'm wanting to close here is actually back in page 19 called um, The Deity of Christ. The deity of Christ is, is oftentimes one of the most attacked areas of Jesus Christ himself. False teachers attack this portion of God and who he is. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, it talks about how there are those out there that are preaching a different Jesus. They're preaching a different spirit. They're preaching a different gospel that do not line up with what the biblical truth shows us. Right? So they're going to be out there. When you're sharing the gospel, you're going to have to be prepared for some pushback. And so we're just going to look directly in our, our book here in page 19. Just go over to page 19 if you have it. If you don't have the book, you just have to listen. Um, I do have a list here. Um, also, I, I forgot this verse. I'm sorry. 1 Timothy 3.16. It says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So the Bible clearly states that God was manifest in the flesh. And if you go back, I didn't, we didn't talk about John 10, 33. So there was a, a man that I met years ago that said, you know what? Jesus never claimed to be God. He only said he was the son of God. He never said he was God the son. Now that terminology is not there. But look at this verse. It says, the Jews answered him saying, for a good man work, we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Even the Jews knew that Jesus Christ was claiming to be God. Jesus was claiming to be God. So he himself claimed it, and there's many more scripture that has. And when we look at, on page 20 here, it talks about the deity through his work. We know by the beginning of Scripture that God created all things. He created everything. But here in John 1, 3, it says, All things were made by him, and without him was anything made that was made. Well, that's something God did. God created. But it's talking about Jesus, which is an attribute of create, what he has done. He, cre he is the creator. Look over on page 21. He is the deity shown through worship. I love this one because... John 9, 30, um, 38 on page 22, it says, and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Now, I like this one too because worship is designated specifically for God. Remember the Ten Commandments. No other gods don't worship idols. No other gods don't worship idols, right? So if Jesus Christ was not God, he would not have received this worship. Now, again, I'm just going through the book right now if you have it. Um, so he would never have received it. He would have denied it. If he was not God and someone worshipped him, he would have stopped that person and he would have said, no, I don't, I don't want to accept this, you know? And so that is proof of his salvation. On page 22 and point four, his deity is shown through his attributes. We talked about his attributes last week, which was his omnipotent. He was powerful. In John, uh, Ma Matthew 28, 18, it says, And Jesus spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven. He was given all power. And then on page 23 here, it says, His deity is shown through his resurrection. That's a pretty important one. And I don't have this verse written. It's not in the book. I have it written down here. It says, It's in John 10, 18. It says, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, 
and I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. He's talking about his life. See, him as God had the power to lay his life down. No man took it, and he had the power to raise it up again. So these are all attributes that he has to be God. See, this is very important because when you get out there and you start sharing the gospel, people are going to push back to this portion of who he is, and he is God. So as we close, guys, on this outline of teaching, we're going to close out the same way we began. Revelation 21.5. When you look at this verse, it takes us back to what we want to see done in the lives of others, the same thing that God wants to see in the lives of others. Revelation 21.5 says this, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He made all things new. That's his desire. That should be our desire. God's desire is to make all things new, and he wants to use you in his plan in order to make this happen, in order to accomplish this. Now, when you guys hear about knocking on doors and going out and talking to people you don't know, some of you might have some butterflies in your stomach because that's something that just these, this day and age you don't see as often. But no matter the gifts and talents that God has given you, because you might say, well, I, I don't speak eloquent like, like Moses, or I, I, I get tired, I, or not tired, but I get scared and I, I have fear and I get excited and, and I don't know what to say. You might have some gifts that others may not have and and you might have some talents that, that you have that others may not have, that others have that you may not have. But when it comes down to it, we all have a responsibility to do the work of an evangelist. That's our responsibility. And I don't have this verse up there, but 2 Timothy 4, 5 says this, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of the ministry. Church, it's our responsibility to watch in all things. That includes the souls of people. To go out and look and ask God, Lord, bring someone into my life that I can share the gospel with. But then it says endure afflictions. You know, there's a chance that something might happen when you're sharing the gospel. You might get a coke thrown on you. You might even be spat upon. Something may happen. Guess what? That's part of it. Endure those afflictions. Work through them. Know that whatever you face is nothing compared to what Jesus Christ faced for you. And then it says, do the work of an evangelist. You may not have the gift of an evangelist. There are some people out there when they preach and share the gospel, just people come in groves. I'm not one of those people. I share the gospel and it's like I'm watering. Somebody else comes and shares the same exact message and they just come and that's okay. But we're still to do the work of an evangelist. Why are we to do that? Because the last part of this verse says, make full proof of thy ministry. The word thy is in there. It's personal. It's yours. Make full proof. That means to carry out, accomplish the ministry that God has given you. And that ministry is the ministry of reconciliation. He's given that to you and I. So you need to, I need to, allow God to challenge our faith. And I'm going to close out with this quote. It's a quote of a pastor up north by the name of Matt Brocker. And this is something that I heard him say and I hope it resonates with you, and it might be something you might have to chew on a little bit. But this is his quote, Lord, keep me involved in the things I can't pull off on my own. That's a scary prayer. It's so much of a scary prayer that in his testimony, his wife would ask him, um, before you pray that, let me know <laughs> so I can prepare myself. Because what you're doing is, if you truly mean that, keep me involved in things I can't pull off on my own. Lord, put me in vulnerable situations. Put me in situations where I have to live by faith. I can't live by my own power, my own strength. And I promise you that if you approach it with that heart of humility and humbleness, he will. But I tell you what, his power will be revealed. We're going to take the next few minutes. I'm going to go ahead and ask everybody to stand. And we're just going to take a couple of minutes that I want you to be able to spend time with your Lord um, and really ask him, maybe, Lord, put me in this position. Ask the Lord today, Lord, how would you have me to be prepared? Whether it's memorizing scripture, whether it's uh, actually going out with somebody who has shared the gospel with someone and challenge yourself to put yourself in these situations. So I'm going to ask that to go ahead and the music to begin. Just take one or two minutes. You can come up here. Um, Spend some time with the Lord. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior and God has gotten a hold of your heart, 
Now's the day of salvation. Do some business with your Lord.